right field. Deep. Red Sox legend Dwight Evans is best known for his fantastic fielding for nearly two decades as the Red Sox right fielder. Oh, what a catch he made! Long drive, left field. But did you know that he hit more home runs than any American leaguer in the 1980s? And he played more games for the Sox than anyone except legend Carl Yastrzemski. When you examine Dwight's complete record, it certainly becomes evident that he belongs in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Should Dwight Evans be enshrined in baseball's Hall of Fame? You decide as he takes us on his life's journey on this special edition of the Red Sox Report presented by CVS Pharmacy. Dwight Michael Evans was born November 3rd, 1951 in Santa Monica, California. Before he was a year old, his family moved to Kailua, Hawaii, where his father Duff worked at the Sheraton Hotel. I'd go to school barefoot in shorts and a t-shirt, do my homework on the beach, and, uh, and uh, that's a great way to grow up. Dwight was the fourth of five children. His two older brothers, David and Duff Jr., surfed the big waves of Hawaii. The waves were too big, I could body surf, and uh, they would surf, and I, I wasn't allowed, I was too small. Dwight's mother, Marie, took care of the five Evans children. She'd play catch with me. She could make uh, a great meal out of nothing. We didn't have much. Before Dwight was 10 years old, the family moved back to Southern California, to Northridge, just outside of Los Angeles. After seeing Dwight play softball on the playground, his fourth grade teacher suggested that he join Little League. He hadn't played baseball before. My parents didn't have the money, it cost $20, so my grandfather had a ranch and, and he uh, told me if I worked uh, I, that he would pay me $20, I could join Little League. He had orange groves and I had to uh, plow the orange groves at uh, 9, 10 years old which was someone driving a tractor at nine, 10 years old for me is, I mean, I had that was the time of my life. And at the end of the day, he gave me a $20 bill. Dwight's big brothers didn't play baseball, so he learned it on his own. When Dwight reached high school, he tried out for the JV baseball team. Went out for the team in the 10th grade and I, I didn't make it, I was an alternate. And so I didn't make my high school team. That, the next year I transferred to Chatsworth High School where I made the varsity team and I was all West Valley this and all West Valley that. Mostly third base, but I, I would pitch and, and, you know, people say to me, your arm, uh, where did you get, what, did you, what kind of exercise did you do? And I, I, I don't have any answer for that other than, you know, it's a God-given talent. Just 14 years old at Chatsworth High, Dwight met the love of his life, Susan Severson. After a year of asking, Susan finally said yes to a date at the movies. So he's going to be all cool and he snuggles over and he goes to put his arm around me, whops me right in the nose and the mouth, almost takes me out. Well, you got to remember, I mean, I, I, I was shy and I, you know, I, I had a big move for me to put my arm around a, a girl and, and uh, <laughs> I messed it up. Somehow it worked out as they continued to date through high school. And baseball was working out as well. Senior year, I was uh, scouted by uh, about 13 teams, but never by the Red Sox. Although they hadn't seen him play, the kid who didn't make the JV team was drafted by the Red Sox in the fifth round in June of 1969. Joe Stevenson signed me, and uh, he said that, he said uh, he heard from another scout that draft this kid, but he never saw me play. But when they did see him play, the Sox knew they had something special. Dwight Evans heads far from California to begin his minor league career next as the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy, continues. The 
Red Sox fifth round draft choice, third baseman Dwight Evans was just 17 years old. His first stop on the way to the major leagues was rookie ball in Jamestown, New York. I got there and I, I soon found out I didn't, I didn't, uh, they didn't have a uniform for me. There was like 15 guys there and we were working out in jeans and, and a hat and, and uh, shoes. And I took batting practice for a week and, and they saw that I could hit and finally they made some moves and I got a uniform. And, uh, but it took a while and then I realized, what I realized was I was MVP of the West Valley in San Fernando Valley, but then here was the MP, MVP of Chicago and an MVP of Dallas and MVP of uh, San Francisco. And, you know, so I, the talent was, was tremendous, you know. So you, you felt pretty small. In his first season in the minors, a change of position changed his entire career. Jackie Moore was the manager, and uh, he told me one night, he says, you're going to play third base tonight. And I said, great, it's my opportunity. The third baseman had just come back from Vietnam. He was 24 years old. And here's this little punk kid, 17, taking his position. So as I run by him, he spits on me. And I'm trying to, he had two black leopard tattoos on each arm and his, his sleeves were cut off so you could see him, he had big arms. And I said, I was smart enough to say, I'm not gonna tangle with this guy. This went on for about a week and I, I went in and talked to Jackie Moore. He says, we've been seeing him. He's been in Vietnam, we wanna give him a shot. In fact, he's going to play tonight. And I said, okay. So he played, and he got so hot. So I couldn't take him out. But the next night, the number one draft choice, Kurt Sutchin in right field, twisted his knee, had to come out of the game. They turned around to me and said, can you play right field? I said, yeah. I went out there and never missed a game. <laughs> that, was, that was the beginning of right field. Dwight's second season in the minors was spent in single-A Greenville, South Carolina. And when he returned to California, he and Susan were married. We well, were both 18, and, and you think about getting married at 18, it just, uh, here we are 40 years later. So, um, I guess it worked. Yeah. And she is the love of my life, and couldn't be uh, happier. More in love today than I was yesterday. Susan moved from town to town with Dwight as he progressed steadily up the minor league ladder. We didn't have a phone and we couldn't afford anything, so I made my own clothes and, and you did what you had to do. And when the season was over, because really what he made was below the poverty level, I think, at that time, and we would go back to California and we together, we would paint houses with some friends from high school. but. We had fun. Yeah. We didn't know any better. It's just what you did. And we grew up through all of that. And I realized what a wonderful man he was and how strong. And I always looked up to him. And I always knew those arms would be there for me. And so it is heart. And that was all I could ever ask for. Each season, Dwight progressed steadily up the minor league ladder. And went to Instructional League and went to Winston-Salem the following year at 19, which is uh, the Carolina League, which is a good, good single A. Played uh, Instructional League again. I tried to get as much baseball as I could. Dwight skipped double A Pawtucket and at just 20 years old went straight to triple A Louisville. Daryl Johnson was the manager. And right around All-Star break, I'm hitting 172. And Daryl Johnson comes to me and he says, you've got eight days to get your affairs, you're hitting your offensive affairs in line. And I, I appreciate that. I couldn't understand why I wasn't sent down because I was really struggling. But because I, I, I had a lot of confidence in my defense and I was still helping the team out. I went back and my roommate at that time was Stan Williams, who Stan Williams was 35 years old. And he says, you're going to go down. If you go down, you go down kicking, fighting, and scratching. You're going to work. So you come to the ballpark tomorrow. Well, he took me out to right field in Louisville, and the fence is probably 15 feet high, concrete. 
He's throwing curveballs, he's throwing fastballs. He's telling me, stay there with your shoulder, stay there with your shoulder. And uh, this went on about four days. And fourth, fourth night, I went two for three. And that was a big accomp accomplishment right then because I, I had not been hitting at all. And uh, two for three, the next night I went three for four. The night after that, I went four for four. But we kept working. And I went on, I went on a hitting spree uh, where I went 43 for, or 42 for 63. And that's almost unheard of. And believe it or not, that got me to 240. That's how bad I was. I had that many at bats, so it got me to 240. But I ended up hitting 400 the rest of the year from that point. And I ended up hitting 300 on the nose. I led the league in RBIs, and I ended up being MVP of the league. So I had a tremendous uh, finish there. Went from uh, uh, the outhouse to big house, if, if, if you will. During that season's AAA playoffs, Dwight was summoned for a meeting with the manager. Daryl Johnson called me in his office and he says, you're going to, you're going to the big club and you're going to meet them in New York. And I was, uh, you're going to need a sports coat. So I had to get a sports coat. I had to, had to uh, do certain things. And uh, no, it was great. It was, it was a long time ago, but I was 20 years old and, and it was a tremendous thrill for me. Dwight Evans becomes a Boston Red Sox when the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy, continues. In September of 1972, Dwight Evans was called to the big leagues. He caught up to the Sox at the old Yankee Stadium. That's where Ruth played, and, and I could still see Maris hitting his 61st home run and, uh, you know, on TV. It was that old park, and uh, I walked around in center field and just really, you know, walking on uh, air I was. and, and uh, went through the monuments because they were in play. They were like, I think, 460-something out in the center field. I was impressed. The pressure was intense as the Sox were locked in a pennant race. It wasn't a warm and fuzzy welcome for the 20-year-old Evans. I can remember taking batting practice, and the extra guys, they wouldn't let you hit. You jump in there, and you take a swing, they'd jump in right, and you go, well, what's going on here? So you just get out of the cage. They didn't want you to get better, and they didn't want to lose their, uh, their, their jobs. So you had to really fight for, for, for your swings and just in batting practice. Dwight didn't get to play in New York, but soon thereafter, September 16th of 1972, he made his major league debut at Fenway Park as a pinch runner. The next day, he got his first of 2,446 major league hits. Gaylord Perry was pitching, and the first, first time up, the first pitch was right on the outside corner, and it looked like it was 120 miles an hour. Just, it, I said, man, I, this is the big leagues. I can't, I can't hit that. Next pitch was a slider, and he got up and uh, hit a bullet off the left field wall. About halfway up, it'd been a home run in any other ballpark. But uh, I, I rounded first base, heading for second, and I saw the ball coming in. I said, I got to get back, so I had to scramble to get back to first base. And uh, that was my first hit off Gaylord Perry. And, and uh, that was 1972, and I didn't get another hit off Gaylord Perry until 1976. That's, a, that's an 0 for 4 right there. That's 0 for 4 years. As the Sox barely hung on to first place in September, manager Eddie Casco had confidence in Dwight, starting him in left field 16 times. Once I started playing, I played every game. And to be, to be put in that position when you're in a pennant race and they put a rookie out there, you know, I felt pretty good. You know, it was a lot of confidence there. Due to an early season strike in 1972, Detroit had played one more game than the Sox. But the Sox clung to a half-game lead over the Tigers as the regular season concluded with a three-game set in Detroit. Three games to decide the East Division winner. The Tigers won the first two games of the series. The Sox won the third to finish just a half-game out. 
The following season, 1973, Dwight went to spring training with the Sox in Winter Haven, Florida. He was fighting for a job, and with his first child, Timothy, just born, fighting to get some sleep. He had colic, and, and if you know anything about colic, you don't sleep. The baby's not sleeping, and, and so we're in a little hotel room. No one's, no one's sleeping and trying to make a ball club. It was tough. The battle to be the Red Sox right fielder lasted all of spring training. Cecil Cooper is a great player, great hitter, and uh, we're competing for the job for the, for the last spot. And uh, Eddie Casco said it's between you and Cooper, and we have made our mind up last game. I hit a double down the line, Cecil pops up, I go to Boston, he goes to Pawtucket. Dwight wore uniform number 40, but quietly he wanted to wear number 24, the number of his idol, Willie Mays. In 1973, the Sox gave him Mays' number. He was my, my hero growing up, and, and uh, I loved 24, and, uh, and that's why I wore it. And I would see Willie in spring training when I was 21 years, 20 years old, and I, I couldn't talk to him. I just was in awe by him. Dwight was told to adapt his hitting style to take advantage of Fenway Park's left field wall, the green monster. That made me a lousy hitter. Uh, my power was from center to right center, and I changed that in Fenway Park. So Fenway Park can, can change you if, if uh, you don't have the proper instruction and guys telling you, hey, stay with your strength. It was a rough rookie season at the plate. He hit just 223. I really didn't know how to hit. Although his hitting was inconsistent, his defense in Fenway's challenging right field was stellar. The ball is hit real hard down that line can, you know, turn. Left-hander hits that ball, right-hander, all of a sudden it goes by first base and it's turning. Now it's in foul territory. Karam is off that wall and can kick out. Or it can stay pretty straight and run right along that line and go right along the outfield. And you're looking at inside the park or at least a triple or, or possibly an inside the park home run. There's a lot of angles out there. In his second full season, 1974, Dwight improved at the plate, hitting 281 and driving in 70 runs. Late that season, a couple of hot hitting outfielders named Jim Rice and Fred Lynn were called up. And these guys just, you know, both of them just jumped right in there and took over where they left off in AAA, and, and they had tremendous numbers in AAA, and they started putting those numbers on the board when they got to the big leagues. What I look for to Dwight for was how to position myself against certain hitters. And I said, you know, you know, can you help me out with positioning on some of these guys? And he was more than happy to do so. By 1975, Carl Yastrzemski and Jim Rice were splitting time in left field. Fred Lynn patrol center. Back. Lynn going back, jumping, and he makes a superb catch. He's got it. And Dwight was a fixture in right. It may have been the finest fielding outfield ever. Between them, they won 19 gold gloves. We uh, tried to help each other, and, and uh, you know, I, I won eight gold gloves, and I, a lot of it was because of a great fielder next to me. In this ballpark, because there's so many people and it's so loud, you have to have great communication with your flank guys. And he always knew if he heard me, back off. And again, with we did hand signals a lot, Dwight and I. As soon as he knew he was going to catch, I watched if his glove went up, I, I knew he had it. As rookies, Rice and Lynn had MVP caliber seasons. Lynn won the Most Valuable Player Award and the Sox won the American League pennant. They would face the legendary Big Red Machine, the Cincinnati Reds. He's not thrown tonight. Here's a fly ball hit into left field. Foster back on the warning track and he will not get it. It's a home run and a tie ball game. Dwight's ninth inning two-run homer tied World Series game three, but the Sox lost in extra innings. In Game 6, one of the most tense back-and-forth battles in baseball history, Dwight was on third with the Reds' third baseman, Pete Rose, nearby. And he looks at me and he's looking around and he says, is this an unbelievable game? This might be the best game I've ever played in. Can you believe we're playing in this game? 
In the 11th inning of that tied up game six, one of the greatest plays in Red Sox history helped make Carlton Fisk's famous moment possible. Here's Ken Griffey Sr. on first base. He could run. He was one of the fastest guys in baseball. Now I've got Joe Morgan at the plate, so I'm saying, if hits it over my head, I, there's no tomorrow. I've got to go in the stands. Morgan hits a ball at me. So the, the natural thing, he hit, hits it over my head, so I turn towards the line because the ball normally turns towards the line too. Well, this particular ball didn't turn. This ball stayed straight. So I'm getting back and I'm running back. It's hard to illustrate it, but I'm running back and the ball is here on this side of my head and it's not turning at all. So it looks awkward because I lost the ball from here to here. And you ask any player, when you lose a ball, that's a scary situation. And so no one was more surprised than me. I jumped and my glove went behind my head and the ball landed in my glove. Thank God I caught the ball because, uh, you know, it goes in the stands. He had a cannon. He just reared back. He, he spun, reared back, and fired towards the infield, and they doubled him off the first base. And it, it, was, a, it was a game saving play. Although the Sox would lose the series in seven games, that postseason, that catch, and that national exposure vaulted Dwight into the conversation of top fielders in the game. No coincidence that in 1976, he won his first gold glove. He was fortunate to have a great arm, and he practiced on That was another thing. He practiced with that great arm. And he had many assists, but also what doesn't show up is the number of times that coaches wouldn't send runners, wouldn't wave runners to third, wouldn't send runners home because of Dwight being in right field. They look at certain guys and they say, he's a, he's a great defensive player. They look at other guys and they say, he's, he's a power hitter. And I look at the guy's numbers and I go, well, I had more home runs than that guy, or I had more RBIs, I had more extra base hits than that guy, but I'm a defensive guy. And, uh, but I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. I just say, I, when people say, boy, you're a great, you had a great arm, you, you're a great defensive player, I also go, I could hit, too. Thanks for joining us for part one of the story of Red Sox legend Dwight Evans. In part two, the conclusion, some difficult family challenges arise yet Dwight becomes one of the top hitters of the 1980s. For all Showtimes, please go to Nesson.com.